You'll recall last week we introduced you to the idea that Homo erectus evolved different regional features in different parts of the world. Different features in East Asia, different features in Southeast Asia, in Europe, and in Africa. This week, as we begin to think about the origins of modernity, including anatomical modernity, we can see how these regional features evolve as we move into the late Pleistocene. And what we'll see is that many of these regional features remain in place, however with modifications as they move towards an overall more modern appearance. Looking at the map, we'll begin by looking at Southeast Asia again. And you'll see here some of the familiar sites that we've already talked about on the island of Java, and we'll talk about one site briefly actually on the continent of Australia, Willandra Lakes. Now recall that when we go back to the earliest remains from Southeast Asia, specimens like Sandron 17, that large robust male, there are certain features that we see evident in these specimens. Long sloping foreheads, a fairly low cranial vault, a very prominent nuchal torus, in the case of Sandron 17, a continuous superorbital torus across the front, a very wide face associated with these broad flaring zygomatics, and we can see these features continue on in later specimens from Southeast Asia, such as the two remains from the middle Pleistocene site of Sambu Machan, Sambu Machan 3 on the left, Sambu Machan 1 on the right. And again we have a prominent superorbital torus, uh, a little bit of a flare on the edge of that that we know refer to as a frontal trigon, which you can see repeated on both specimens here long cranial vault, the continuation again of prominent development of the nuchal torus in the back of the skull. In the case of these specimens, which are perhaps a million years later in time than the earlier Sangeron material, we have a higher cranial vault associated with a larger endocranial volume, but again we still have a fairly long flat sloping forehead beginning right at the superorbital torus and continuing up to the top of the skull. As we move forward in time, we can see these characteristics replicate themselves. The site of Nandong, also coming from Java, is perhaps as young as 50,000 years of age, though maybe more likely something like 150 to 200,000 years of age. And if we look here with Sambugmachan 4 on the left and Nandong 5 on the right, it's remarkable how similar these two specimens are, even though they may be separated by as many as 300 or 400,000 years. Again, we still have a prominent superorbital torus in the front. We have a long sloping forehead extending up to the apex of the skull. We have a very prominent and well-developed nuchal torus sitting on the back. You can see almost this lever-like bar sitting out here, replicated in the Sambugmachan specimen. The overall cranial vault height of this specimen has increased associated with an expanded endocranial volume and a larger brain. Uh, the length has also increased a little bit associated with this. And if we were to look superiorly, we'd see the breadth of the skull has also expanded. But much of the morphology has been replicated between this earlier Sangmon Chan specimen and the later Nandong specimen. Now Nandong actually has a wealth of cranial material preserved. Here are just three of those specimens seen here, Nandong 1, Nandong 10, and Nandong 11. And in all of these features we can see many of these characteristics replicated. Again, the long sloping forehead coming straight from the superorbital torus, seen on all three of these specimens. The prominent angular torus around the backside of the temporal and parietal and occipital region, seen again on all three of these specimens. The little lever here associated with the frontal trigon, associated with the posterior side of the superorbital torus laterally on the skull. So we can see these morphologies replicate themselves again and again and again, maintaining some of the continuity that we see in these regional features in Southeast Asia, even as the specimens overall move towards a more modern appearance, including larger brain size, reduced superorbital torus, and a closer approximation of the overall anatomically modern condition. We can see that comparison dramatically here, with Nandong 1 on the left, and Willandra Lakes 50, an anatomically modern Homo sapien from the continent of Australia, on the right. Now, Australia was probably settled first about 70,000 years ago, and we think because of the complexity associated with colonizing Australia, particularly the open sea passage necessary to reach Australia, that Australia is only populated by anatomically modern Homo sapiens. And yet when we look at Nandong 1 compared to WLH 50, and WLH50 is a big specimen. It has an endocranial volume that's large even for modern humans. We see many features replicated. The long sloping forehead beginning from a fairly prominent superorbital torus. The long nuchal plane of the occipital bones seen in the back here. And the bracketing or the flexion of the posterior portion of the skull replicating themselves across these two specimens. So again, Southeast Asia is one of the first places and most obvious places where we see this trend of regional continuity in many of the features that we observe, even as we begin to incorporate more modernity in terms of the overall morphology of the specimens that we see. But it's not the only place. We can also look at East Asia and see a similar kind of pattern emerge.
Recall last week we talked about the site of Zhou Qian and some of the cranial remains from Zhou Qian. And we can see within Zhou Qian, for example, evidence of variability in what overall middle Pleistocene cranial specimens from East Asia look like. The L3 construction here on the left, the L2 construction on the right, perhaps illustrative of the kind of sexual dimorphism that we see in East Asia at this time period. But moving forward in time, we can see many of those features replicated in later, perhaps early anatomically modern Homo sapiens from East Asia, Yunishan on the left, Dali on the right. Dali perhaps indicative of a male morphology this time period, and Yunishan is certainly a female. As you'll see in a moment, we have a preserved pelvis from the specimen. But we have many of the same features we saw at Zhou Chen. A fairly prominent superorbital torus that takes the form of a double arching bar over each orbit. Uh, a, a somewhat prominent forehead on the specimen, though less preserved on Dali. A fairly long cranial vault. A flat face with zygomatics that face directly anteriorly, if you look at them in the side view here. Um, somewhat flexed orbits uh, on both of these specimens as well. And many of these features, again, that we saw in the earlier specimens from Choco Chen. Looking anteriorly, we can see these features more clearly. So again, we have a double-arched superorbital torus, as we saw in the earlier specimens. Notice in Dali, perhaps the male of these two, we see that that feature is much more pronounced than it was in earlier specimens. Again, we have these very flat zygomatics that are facing anteriorly on both of these specimens, clearly separated from the overall nasal aperture area, which is quite broad on the male Dali specimen, more reduced on the perhaps female Yunishan specimen. Looking at Yunishan a little more closely, and at the cranial base of Yunishan, we can see that it has a very reduced M3, a very modern characteristic in this case, and the overall flatness and breadth, particularly of the posterior portion of the cranial base, in other words, the nuchal plane of the occipital bone back here is again very representative of the overall modern condition. If you were to find this occipital bone in isolation, you would have a hard time rejecting the hypothesis that this was a modern human skull. Yunishan again preserves a partial skeleton actually. Uh, part of that left innominate is seen here. And one of the things about the Yunishan pelvis, which it turns out seems to be characteristic of all pre-modern Homo sapiens pelvis, is that it's a very long pubis bone. If we compare this to a modern human, the pubis bone, this middle portion of the pelvis, is very broad. We see this actually replicated in Neanderthals, so pre-modern populations from Europe. We see it replicated in pre-modern populations from Africa as well. So it might be simply that this is characteristic of pre-modern populations everywhere, a relatively broad pelvis, particularly anteriorly, associated with the expansion of the pubic bone, the midline portion of the pelvic bone, in other words. Um, moving slightly more south in China, we have this specimen, Maba, coming from the southeast China coast. And again, we have a slightly different variant of the morphology, but many of the same features, and again a convergence towards an overall more modern appearance. Maba has the most pronounced forehead of these early Chinese remains, again indicative of an expansion of the endocranial volume, particularly anteriorly on the skull. It again has a somewhat prominent superorbital torus, though not nearly as large as that of Dali, and zygomatics that come out laterally and have an overall, however, anterior position relative to the skull itself. So again, we see some of these features. Moving on to Africa, we can look at what happens to the variation within Africa, going from the middle to later Pleistocene. You'll recall some of these sites that we looked at earlier, and some of them we'll talk about and introduce today. Now, you recall Bodo was that very prominent middle Pleistocene specimen from Africa, broad zygomatics, a fairly thick superorbital torus that in the case of Bodo at least existed as a double arch, a fairly long sloping forehead, a nice sagittal keel running down the midline, and a very broad nasal aperture. Now moving forward in time, we can see again a record of continuity towards a modern appearance within Africa. Here we have Bodo on the left. The slightly later specimen of Kabwe, which we also talked about last week, shown here. And then we have two specimens which are typically described as anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Herto, a specimen that's about 160 to 180,000 years of age coming from Ethiopia. And Kafsa 9, an anatomically modern Homo sapien actually from the Levant, from a site that's in today Israel. And as we look across this lineage, again we can see evidence of continuity as we move through time. If you look at the transition from Bodo to Kabwe to Herto, for example, you can see a slight reduction in the superorbital torus, but a continuity in terms of the double arched appearance, the fairly prominent zygomatics, but moving towards an overall more modern feature. You recall that when we talked about the Zhou Chen specimens last week, I mentioned that the malar notch, 
this little divot on the underside of the maxillary zygomatic connection is a modern feature. We don't see it in specimens like Bodo or Cobwe, but we see it make its appearance in Herto, again indicative of a more reduced but anteriorly facing facial structure. In Costa 9, we can see an expansion to a more globular cranial vault, something that's associated with greater flexion basically in the cranial base of the specimen, that portion of the skull that connects the face of the skull to the cranial vault. And again, we can see this feature actually gradually move towards a more modern condition as we move throughout these specimens. Looking in some more detail at Herto on the left, an Omo 2, a specimen similar in time period coming from the northern Omo Basin area of the Ethiopian-Kenyan border, we can again see evidence of the appearance of more modern-like features. Again, Herto is a huge specimen. It's actually the one sitting next to me on the left, and it has a very large endocranial volume. An endocranial volume well within the larger end of the range of living humans, actually. And in terms of its overall proportions, it's incredibly long. Notice as we look at its face, however, it has very prominent projecting superobital tori. It also has very prominent zygomatics and a large, still somewhat projecting lower face. This face looks modern relative to those specimens that preceded, but you wouldn't mistake it necessarily for our modern Homo sapien if we were to put it into a contemporary osteological collection. So in other words, modernity in this case is a relative descriptor for Herto, relative to the material that came before it. And we see the beginnings of more modern-like features, but in the context of a still somewhat archaic overall cranial specimen. Going back to the comparison we illustrated here earlier between Herto and Omo II, we can again see some variation within Africa as well. Recall that one of the defining features of the African specimens is simply that they're much more variable than many of the other regional populations. While in Herta we have a bit of frontal brossing in terms of a vertical forehead, in Omo we have a much more Southeast Asian-like condition in terms of a long sloping forehead going directly from the supraorbital torus up to the bregma, as opposed to the projection of the supraorbital torus and then the frontal bossing that we see here in Herta. Moving ahead, there are also specimens, interesting specimens, from North Africa at this time period. The site of Jebel Erhud in Northwest Africa actually preserves two cranial specimens, one of which looks more modern in many features than the other, but overall they show, again, a blending of modern and archaic features. Jebel Erhud has a very flat vertical face with a reduced superorbital torus, features that we again associate with modernity. Jebel Erhud II couples some of those features, again we have a very reduced superorbital torus, with an overall lower cranial vault and a longer cranial vault that has a bit of a projection in the occipital bone in the back, something that in Europe we might describe as a ne occipital bun and is actually a feature that we associate with European Neanderthals. We see that feature to a lesser degree in Jebel Erhud I, making Jebel Erhud I appear to be more modern than Jebel Erhud II, despite the fact that they're found in the same context, and we believe both date to about 120,000 years before the present. Now the one region we haven't yet talked about is Europe, which we're going to talk about in more detail later this week, specifically talking about the origin of Neanderthals. Neanderthals play a prominent role in our understanding of human evolution because they're such a widely discussed and widely studied topic. So we'll talk about Neanderthals in just a minute. But first it's important to recap and state that many of these regional features which we saw develop in the middle Pleistocene, we see continue into the later Pleistocene. We see them changed and modified as we get more anatomical modernity incorporated into the specimens we're looking at, such as increased cranial capacity, reduced dental size, but many of those regional features persist, even as modernity begins to become more present in the cranial specimens we look at.